Hi everyone and welcome back. Have you ever had a moment in your life when you felt like you're going through motions? Like your favorite song sounded like a noise or your favorite food tasted like a cardboard or even a hug felt really meaningless. And we all have those moments from time to time. But what if that feeling wasn't passing by? What if that feeling was actually the new norm? And this isn't just a metaphor for a bad day, but it is a profound and very often misunderstood reality of anhedonia, which is a symptom of depression that is actually impacting millions of people and robbing them of their ability to experience pleasure. Anhedonia is the reason someone could win the lottery but still feel nothing, or a parent spending time with their child but being unable to experience any joy. Today we are going to dive into the neuroscience of this condition. Um, we're going to talk about its origins and how it impacts mental health. And also we're going to be talking about the new promising research that helps us to fight back. And if you're gonna stick around next week, I'm gonna publish a second part to this video where I'm gonna be talking about ways how we can deal with anhedonia. So let's get started. The term anhedonia comes from the Greek and without and hedon pleasure. While often seen as secondary symptom of depression, its presence often signals a more severe and treatment resistant form of the illness. Researchers often differentiate between two types, social anhedonia, the loss of interest in social contact, and physical anhedonia, the inability to feel pleasure from physical sensations. So why this happen? The answer lies in brain's reward system a complex network of structures and chemicals designed to motivate us to reinforce life-sustaining behaviors. The undisputed star of the system is the neurotransmitter dopamine. You might be surprised, but dopamine doesn't just create pleasure, but it is about motivation and reward prediction. So dopamine says to our brain, hey, this is important, pay attention and do this again. So it is like our internal engine that drives our motivations, our desire for wanting things. So when we are hungry, we want a meal. When, um, for instance, there's a certain goal that we want to achieve. So then we have a motivation to, to go and, and do this. The main highways for dopamine are the mesolimbic and mesocortical pathways, which originate in the ventral tegmental area, VTA. From there, they project to critical areas like the nucleus accumbens and the prefrontal cortex, which is involved in complex decision-making and planning. In a healthy brain, these regions work in harmony with the VTA to NAC circuit driving the pursuit of reward and the prefrontal cortex helping to decide if that reward is worth the effort. In anhedonia, this entire system is disrupted, dysregulated and we have studies that consistently shown us through neural images that there's deficient activation of ventral striatum area that also includes the nucleus accumbens in people with anhedonia so it is as if the main hub for the reward um, in our brain when silent so even when people are being exposed to things that normally would give them pleasure like for instance art music sports food now even though they're exposed to them they feel nothing and this leads us to make distinction between wanting and liking so the dopamine system is mainly driving the wanting or the motivation to seek reward on the other hand, other systems, like for instance the opioid system, is driving the liking, which is the subjective experience of pleasure. In people who are experiencing anhedonia, both of the systems they can be impaired, leading to both the person lacking the motivation to seek the reward and also them lacking to feel the pleasure even once the task is completed or once they engage with the activity. So it is really a double-edged sword that cripples the desire of joy and also the experience of it. 
while neurobiology is central here and hedonia isn't just a simple chemical imbalance but it is a very complex interaction between biology psychology and also environment for example we have research that suggests that chronic stress and trauma can create a state of neuroinflammation in a body that then can interfere with our brain's reward system and this can explain why some people who for instance experience chronic stress develop anhedonia without really going through the classic depressive episodes we also know that cortisol which is the stress hormone when it's chronically elevated can damage our neurons uh, within the reward pathways making us less responsive to dopamine moreover anhedonia is a key predictor of worse long-term prognosis many traditional antidepressants particularly ssris which work by increasing serotonin often fail to specifically address anhedonia and this is actually the main reason why many people they fail to achieve the full remission so the sadness might be lifted but the world around them still feels really great so they're stuck in the cycle of not being able to feel the pleasure or enjoyment from activities and then because of that they feel lack of motivation to engage with those activities that could actually help them to recover fully because anhedonia can be subtle often can be missed and it is not that emotional dramatic meltdown but it can actually show in very nuanced ways so for instance maybe you used to love reading books but now when you read the words are really meaningless or maybe you find yourself cancelling plans with friends and not because you are sad but because the feeling of socializing with people feels like such a chore rather than actually source of fun and you might be surprised but anhedonia can also show in physical symptoms like for instance a chronic fatigue or lack of energy because its body lost the reward driven energy to do anything the impact on daily life is profound so for instance relationships they suffer because of the lack of desire to connect work performance declines and overall the quality of life plummets often leading to a deep isolation it is crucial to dispel the myth that anhedonia is a choice or a sign of laziness it is a biological and psychological reality a symptom rooted in a real changes in the brain that requires professional help but the good news is that there's a growing research that specifically is a focusing on treatments that can help us to deal with anhedonia New drugs such as bupropion and ketamine show promise because they act directly on the dopamine system and other pathways implicated in anhedonia. Bupropion, for example, it is a dopamine and norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor, which can help with restoring motivation. On the other hand, ketamine, low doses of ketamine and the clinical supervision, they have been shown to restore synaptic activity in brain regions that has been inactive due to chronic stress. And then we have behavior activation that operates on the principle of acting your way into a new way of thinking. So it focuses on identifying and scheduling activities that were once rewarding even if they don't feel good at first. So the goal is to re-engage with the world and gradually resensitize the brain's reward system, essentially teaching it how to feel pleasure again. And this isn't about faking it, but it is about recreating the neural circuits. And lastly, we have cutting edge treatments such as the repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulations that are being applied to parts of the brain that are taking part in a reward processing. And this is really an option, a non-invasive option that can be used for people 
who've maybe used other traditional methods and maybe they haven't responded well to them, such as the psychotropic medication or talking therapy. By applying magnetic pulses to the prefrontal cortex, RTMS can help restore activity to a dormant reward system. If you or anyone else is dealing with this numbing silence of anhedonia, remember that this condition isn't a flaw of your character. It isn't a sign that you are lazy, but it is a treatable condition. And by understanding the science behind it, we can remove the stigma and also find ways to help you deal with this condition. And if you are interested in learning how to deal with anhedonia, then I would encourage you to come back here next week when I'm going to upload a second part of this video where I'm going to be giving you various ways of how you can start dealing with anhedonia. And as always, if you enjoyed this video, then please like it, subscribe. And also, if you think that anyone could benefit from watching this video, then please share it with them. And I'm going to see you in the next one then. Thank you. Bye-bye.